Cool. So, I mean, I asked before, does anyone... I mean, like, has anyone actually ever done any fuzzing? I mean, apart from sort of what you, you, you described, basically. Um, has anyone ever used AFL before or lip fuzzer? No. Cool. Okay, right. So I, I've put you all in the right group, I hope. <laughs> um, so I, I always start this by talking about what I would say the history of fuzzing. It's probably a really good way and like what it's actually for. So I hope at least people have either done a bit of programming or at least understand JavaScript. And the, the real basic gist of it is just to at least appreciate what an if statement is. So, you know, you know, you, you make a choice in the program, you make you need to make some sort of decision and you say, well, if this condition is met versus if this condition is met. So if I just switch to my camera, a good example is something like this. So I don't know, I have some in, I have some variable, let's say I and I set it to the value zero. And then I do a check, I say if I is greater than you know, three, oh, they can't write three, then do this, otherwise do this. Now for this course, that is all you really need to understand from sort of a conceptual standpoint, because when it actually comes down to, <clears throat> when it actually comes down to sort of CPU code and assembly, is you don't really have any sort of other decision tree or ability to make a decision it's all sort of based on this idea that you have these things called branch statements that is that you know if a value or something equals one value or one parameter you can either go in one direction or the other direction and that's just the only real critical thing that people sort of need to grasp i hope everyone there just understands that or has at least seen an if statement somewhere <clears throat> or if you haven't like i said you know you just this concept should be pretty simple it's like, you know, it's like going to the shoppers or going to the store, right? You go, if I need some food, I go to the store. Otherwise, I don't go to the store. And it's and that's the real sort of high level description of what I sort of want to make people appreciate during this program. And the other thing to say is as well, is some people may also see, you know, things like for loops or while loops. Now, for and while loops are essentially, if I just separate this, are abstractions of these if statements and i'll go into this a bit later but i just want to sort of make everyone understand that this is this branch statement this idea of making decisions is sort of the most fundamental things that computers can do and we can tell the computer to perform different actions based on different things we give it and this will come in very handy when we start going through some of the instrumentation that's just the first thing i wanted to get out of the way make sure everyone gets that but anyway off topic what is fuzzing and I like to use the example of HTTP, HTTP servers because everyone understands, you know, web browsers. So you have a web browser. Let's say draw this on the left. I'll just put C for client. But this is essentially a web browser. And this is a program, you know, such as Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, you know, whichever one you want to use. And its job is to connect over the Internet to some web server. And there are some rules on how this client talks to the server. You know, it sends a message to the server and the server responds with some, you know, data. <clears throat> and the rules, at least in this example, is what's called HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, just to make everyone aware. Now, the server, you've got to understand, is always sitting there waiting for these requests to come from the client. When you go onto your web browser and you type in www.google.com, you type in, type in bbc.co.uk, whatever it is, your client is sending some data to the server and then the server responds to the client. So you've always got this idea that there are these rules in the middle that govern these messages that go back and forth between clients and servers. Now, it doesn't necessarily always have to be clients and servers. You can have something like a Word document. A Word document uh, is read by the editor so you know microsoft word reads word documents and that again is another one of his interactions the format of that file which in this i guess it's sort of model doesn't exist but the format of that file and how it's read by the actual program is dictated by certain rules specifically xml if you if you know what that is about how you take this data and present it to a user and how the user is able to input it and this is going to be the sort of base example i like to use now <clears throat> 
these clients and these server programs, like I said, Apache, Firefox, these things expect data to be transferred in a certain way, in a certain format. But it turns out that when people write software and people write code, these different rules and these different formats can either get misinterpreted or mistakes get made. And when these mistakes get made or you've interpreted data in, sort of in, a, in a valid way, you've accepted some invalid input, it turns out that that permits you or gives you the ability to change the behavior of either the client or the server. Now, sort of how it does that is not going to be sort of fundamental to this course, but the idea is, is that we have this concept that I'm going to send some data from either the client or the server or the server to the client, and I'm going to make the other, the other side of that conversation act differently. And a really good example of this is a few years ago, which is actually when I say a few years ago, it's maybe like eight years ago, some, I think it was on Xbox Live or PlayStation Network, some, uh, I think it was a little boy or little girl, I can't remember exactly, they went onto the login screen of this Xbox and they just typed in, you know, typed in a bunch of characters. They plugged a keyboard in and just typed in a bunch of characters. And it turns out that if you send in too many characters within the, you know, within the password field or within the login field of Xbox Live, it would just log you in. Now, there was some sort of bug in the software that would, you know, you typed in too many characters and it would just accept your login screen and log you in, which we can all recognize as an issue because you know you don't you then don't need to enter your password and fuzzing fundamentally is about trying to discover those bugs that we can't predict i mean you could argue that one was predictable but these bugs are things that we just don't we don't think about now this all started uh, this idea of fuzzing when people started developing software now i'm not sure if anyone's sort of ever written a unit test or knows what a unit test is i'm hoping some people do but a unit test is a, a good case and a bad case. Well, I would typically hope it's a good case and a bad case to test some sort of code. Now, the example I like to use is, you know, you go onto a website and, you know, it's asking you to type in your email address. <clears throat> and you're going to type your email address into this box here. So I'm just use mine, chris at coder.com or something like that. Now, this format or, or sorry when i enter this email address into this box <clears throat> it's got to comply with a certain format that is one of the most important things about email address is it's got to have an at symbol within the email address somewhere there's got to be a domain so this thing on the right is the domain you know like google.com so it's got to have a domain a valid domain or at least it's formatted correctly and there's got to be some sort of text preceding this at symbol right so my name. So you've got these three components we need to check for. Now, number one, is it a valid domain? Number two, do we have an at symbol? And number three, is there a bit of text before it? <clears throat> now, this email address doesn't have to exist. This check is purely verifying whether or not this is a valid email address. And I'm hoping everyone can sort of at least appreciate that. So if we're going to write this code, so we're just imagine we're the developers and we want to write that, you know, this this one box and its job is to accept an email address. So when we write the code, we might want to test it. So when we test it, we might want to, you know, give it a valid email address. Does this box, does this code that we've written actually accept a valid email address? Because if it doesn't accept a valid email address, then it's pretty pointless. But not only that, we want to check if this box also rejects invalid email addresses. So an invalid email address might just be at with a domain or just an at or just a string without any of the correct formatting. So these are all different cases. So what developers do when they write this software to you know actually check this email address is they go through and they also provide valid cases and invalid cases to test whether or not it's working as expected. Does everyone understand that and appreciate that? Excellent, cool. So that's so this idea of we're giving data, known data, this is the really important thing. If we're giving known data to the program or we're giving known data to our function to do valid validation checks and invalidation checks, <clears throat> that's the idea of a unit test. When we, or me the developer, I write this, <clears throat> sorry, I write, you know, I write, the, I write the program. 
I'm going to provide it a set of tests. And not, not only this, the other thing you've got to realize about sort of software is that this isn't the only thing written in isolation. Someone else is going to write, you know, write the functionality that accepts the username. Someone else is going to write the functionality that accepts the password. And you're going to have various boxes and various different inputs throughout the web page or throughout the program. And another thing that these, these unit tests are really useful for is when you take the different components and stick them together. So like I said, you've got, you know, if this is the main program that we build here, you pull in that email uh, functionality. You've got a password functionality as well. When you integrate this all into the same program, you rerun all of these tests because it could be the case that when I include this email address uh, function and I include this password function, it could corrupt the other one. It could do something that's different and it could make one of them not work. This is what unit tests are really good for. So I think everyone sort of understands this concept. You know, if you are going to write software, you want to make sure the software works right. However, fuzzing goes one step further. And like I said, the distinction about unit tests is that it's about testing known bad variables and known good variables. The issue is, is that there is an infinite amount of different you know, things you can enter into this box if it was infinitely long or you weren't, if there was no restrictions for how many characters. How do you check every single scenario and how do you check every single use case? Well, that's sort of where fuzzing comes in. So if I just draw that, client server drawing again so we've got our client server and we've got this notion of sending data back and forth between the client and server using the HTTP rules and this is just your browser and this is your server right so fuzz testing sort of took the previous concept of unit testing one step further now, initially, and I would say maybe in the 90s and early 2000s, but it still works, it's still, you know, it's still a valid way of testing code, is that what I want to do to test the server is I not only want to write unit tests, but I also, as, you know, as a fuzzer, I want to just send valid and invalid data to the server to see how it performs. So even though I've had a unit test, is there anything else that I didn't include in that unit test that can change the behavior of the server? Now, initially, this was just taking bit random bits of data. So when I mean random bits of data, I mean instead of sending, you know, a valid, you know, a valid HTTP request, I'd just send, you know, 10,000 letter A's or I'd send lots of different at symbols or I'd send lots of different B's with some C's and some F's. So I, instead of me actually sending valid messages, I'd each be sending these randomly generated, well, I'd say strategically generated is probably a better term to use, but I send these randomly generated bits of data to the server to see when I throw something at it, when I throw stuff at a wall, does it stick? Does that server behave differently? So that was the sort of initial uh, initial way that fuzzing was sort of was started, and many people sort of first do this when they're performing a security tech check they'll write a python script and it will just send random data at the server now it tends not to be very effective anymore because you know servers have been around for a long time and people have sort of got wise to this type of thing and have actually improved their code quite a lot so we need to sort of go one step further to see if we can go any deeper um, so i would say this type of fuzzing it's called dumb fuzzing i, I call it dumb fuzzing or you know mutation So this is a definition I want to use. So each time we take a bit of data and we change it and we send it to the server, each one of these changes is called a mutation. I just want to make that clear. So that was the sort of where, where fuzzing initially started. And the really the big difference between this and the unit test is if the unit test was testing, you know, valid and invalid data that we have programmatically put into the, you know, into the software, this test is testing data that we haven't put into the software because all of this stuff is randomly generated. It's not in our unit test. It's testing edge cases that we, we haven't even thought of. And when I say, you know, test cases that we haven't thought of, it's like, 
I've been doing vulnerability research for maybe 15, 20 years now, and there are people that are a lot smarter than me, and we've been given examples before, and we've missed really basic things because, you know, fundamentally, computers think differently to humans, and that's, you know, that's an issue we just can't overcome. And one of the ways we can get over this sort of, uh, over the, I guess, this deficit and, you know, the way we think about, think about, I guess, data is that we actually get tools like fuzzers to perform the analysis and the testing for us. So like I said, that was the sort of first phase. And you have things like Zuff that sort of do this, and Radamza sort of does it, but it's a bit different. Now, I was just saying the second type of fuzzing that I would say or describe is what I would call generational or evolutionary. Now, the big difference here, actually, it's probably good if I do an example, but I'm, I'm hoping that everyone understands or has at least seen a http request before because i'll do one i'll manually do one just to show people but when i describe http it has a very specific format you have a verb at the beginning so it might be get it might be post it might be put there's lots of different ones but this is the idea and it's it's a you know it's a human readable protocol http we can read it as humans and that was the way it was meant to be designed so it comes in three components generally when you're doing requests the first bit like i said here you have what is called the http verb so get post put head <clears throat> the second bit is the resource that you're interested in so this could be index.html so that's going to be actually live within the directory on the web server and the third component is uh, the version number so uh, in this case it's http slash 1.1 so this is just a request you can also send headers within this request but i'm going to leave it quite basic um just just to make it simpler so what i would do typically as a you know as a as a web browser connecting to a web server i'd make a you know connection from the client to the server a tcp connection and i would send this text physically to the server and the server would if it is a correct and valid request it knows what it looks like and it will respond to the client with the resource that i requested so i will just switch to my screen and show you an example i'm not sure has anyone actually ever performed a manual http request before because i'm not sure people know you can do this Yeah, Netcat, right? So I'm going to use Netcat. Netcat is a tool that just opens up a raw TCP socket to a server. And, you know, then it just, because the pipe exists, I can throw any data down that pipe, you know, I want. So I'm going to connect to, uh, let's just say, bbc.co.uk. And I'm going to connect to port 80 because I can't be bothered to mess with encryption. Remember, HTTP uses either port 80 or uses port 443 for encryption. I'm just going to connect to port 80. So now I'm connected to the bbc.co.uk web server and I'm going to physically type in the request. So HTTP, actually, so I'm going to type get. I want to get a resource, index.html, http slash 1.1. Hit enter once, hit enter twice, and it actually returns. This is the response. It says domain not found because I didn't include a specific header. But it, re it responds, this is the header response. These are a bunch of other headers. Sorry, this is the response. This is the headers. And this is the actual HTML page that's been uh, that's been sent back to me. Obviously, it's an error, so it's going to be an error page. But if I just write that to a file and I save it, we can actually view that in the web browser. And if I just open... So this, in the web browser, if I made that same request with a web browser, it would have returned this same page. Like I said, obviously it's an error, but either way, that page has been returned. But the important thing to note here is that all this protocol was expecting was me to physically type out, or, or, or at least manually, or type out this string of data in such a way that the server I connected to, BBC, actually understood my request. Now, like I said, Netcat is the tool that I use to connect to port 80, you know, at this server, which is BBC. 
and then it just allowed me to type in the string get index.http 1.1. So it's really important, as I drew before, this is the format of that data. I could change, you know, get to post, I could change post to head, but in each circumstance, just 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 recognize that this is the this is the physical format I'm using. Because what we're going to do is we're going to change this format and we're going to see if that BBC server will respond differently. Anyway, so this is the format. This is the very specific format for HTTP. You can go online and you can you can download the RFCs and the documents for this, which is really nice. These are generally publicly available. Tim Burns Lee um, wrote these back in 1989 when he was working at CERN. But you know, this is the thing, this is how we know how it's supposed to work. And this is essentially all your web browser is really doing in the background when it's sending data. Obviously, it interprets results differently, but when it's actually doing the communication, this is all it's doing is it's sending these requests, receiving responses, and presenting that information to you in some sort of um, nice way so you can understand it better. So if I said before, the the previous way that we fuzz fuzz servers or fuzz programs was by just sending random data from the client to the server. This time, what we're going to do is we're going to write a description file or a configuration file of some sort. Now, this configuration file is going to describe the format of this data, right? So what I'm going to say for this format of the data is I'm going to provide it a list. My first list is going to be get and post, right? So I'm going to say there's some server, and just to make it simple, is it only accepts, let's just say three. It accepts three different types of information that go into this first location. And when I say that first location, I mean, you know, this, this string here is the thing we're going to be mutating and changing. So I'm going to put these three things in here. And then I'm going to say in any, you can put some sort of random data here whatever you like, but at the end of it, you always need this HTTP 1.1 string. And I'm going to describe, this is going to be a description of what this format formatted data looks like. Is everyone okay with that? Cool, cool, excellent. Now, the difference here is if the previous uh, type of fuzzing was um, completely based on, you know, just sending random data, this now is actually describing the data. And there's a really important concept here that I sort of need people to understand. If I'm going to send a message from the client to the server, let's say this message is just the letter A, for instance. If I send this from the client to the server and it just contains the letter A, this server is just going to get confused and it's going to say, I don't understand that request, go away. In fact, let me try and do it. Actually, let's do a demonstration just to show you. I'm interested to see what it will say. So if I you know, send the letter A to the server, it's going to say bad request because it doesn't understand it. Now remember, it behaved differently to the way it was before, but this time it doesn't understand what A means. So the program or the server is actually behaving differently depending on the type of data we're sending. So one really good example is that if I'm going, if I want to, if let's say there's a bug, let's say there's a bug within the data, within the index.html. Let's say if I put an invalid character within this, you know, within this location, within the string, within the request, it's going to get confused and it's going to crash. Let's just say, for instance, there's no bug on the left here, but there's definitely a bug in the middle, and there's no bug on the right. If I only ever send it the letter A, or I only ever send it the letter B, I will never get past this first check. I will never get past this first check to the second check where I can trigger the bug. This is a concept that I want people to understand because in my my simplified server, I always either need to send get, post, or put first. At least that needs to be the start of the string. And if I don't put at least one of these values, then I can never get to the second column or the second uh, the second bit of data to trigger the bug. Because if I always send an A, like I said, or a B, it will just reject me. It will only ever accept my data or at least partial part of my data, if I send either get, post, or put. Is everyone okay with that concept? Makes sense. Cool. So this is this is actually really uh, 
vital thing to understand as well, more so for sort of later fuzzing, but for now it's equally applicable. So the nice thing about, you know, the difference between, I would say here, which was the, you know, the dumb strategy we were using, the dumb or the uh, mutation based strategy we were using, is that now, instead of me just waiting for the program to eventually, you know, initially send this get message or this post message or this put message, I'm actually telling it in a very basic way to create at least in some way a well formatted request i'm saying you need to format your data in this way otherwise you've got no hope in hell of ever triggering anything else in the server so this is what the sort of second type of fuzzing is as you had these you had these description files that would say this is what the data looks like this is the format it's got to be and it tells you which string and which bit of data exactly you can go ahead and modify and you can go ahead and break and this was the sort of second generation, I would say, the second type of fuzzing that sort of came around. Now, these types of fuzzers, you may have heard of some. So Peach is one. Uh, Sully is another. You've got one called Boofuzz. A lot of these are actually named after Monster Zinc characters because Monster Zinc characters were fuzzy. Um, and another one you might see is uh, Defensix. So I would say th these are still useful because not... Not in every circumstance can you perform the next type of fuzzing on a program. The next type of fuzzing is, is always the best way to go, but you won't always be able to perform it for one reason or another. So things like Peach and Sully and things like Defensix are still valid and still, you know, things you can use. And like you said, Mark, this is like, this is the network level testing and that sort of strip, or I wouldn't say necessarily stress testing, but this is like when everything's integrated and set up. You want to be running something like Defensix against it to do the actual check. Can it stand, you know, at least a myriad of random data? But the difference is, is, you know, at least in this circumstance, we've specified a configuration file to say, look, this is what it looks like. Is everyone OK with that? Because this is the easy stuff. Cool. Is everyone OK with that um, HTTP request that I made as well? Cool. So that was, so I think it was about 2012 to 2014, a really big difference and a really big paradigm shift was changed when, with regards to fuzzing. Now, one thing you've, I've sort of got to go into first is actually describing what a, what a program looks like after it's been reverse engineered. Now, in this entire course, for your sake, because it's simpler, I'm going to write C code. Now, most people don't think c code is that easy to write and most people sort of go oh you know i prefer python or javascript the one thing i've got to say with c code is it doesn't abstract much away from the way that you know the way the computer is going to behave and in this course we're interested in the bare bones how that computer is going to behave now one thing i will say is you can perform foot fuzzing against any programming language out there you can perform it against any type of system what types of bugs exist for that programming language or what types of bugs exist for that system will inherently be different. So things like Rust or Go or you know, JavaScript or Python are built to be memory safe languages. So it's a, you know, you're probably not, not going to see a remote code execution bug exist in them in the same sort of context. However, things like infinite loops, which can also crash your server or crash your or, or put your you know your program into an invalid state are valid for any you know any type of program that can exist and you will never get away from that right people like alan Turing proved that you know there are some problems that computers just cannot solve and this is this whole idea that if a computer never stops right it is it can still be an invalid an invalid sort of uh, an invalid state for it to go into however there's a sort of one little caveat i need to say here is that some programs are designed to run forever and never and never close. A really good example is, you know, Microsoft Windows or Linux or Macintosh. When you press that button on your computer, it would be really fucking annoying if when you press that button, it just showed you a screen and then turned off again. So that's how pro how computers are really supposed to work. They're very I would I wouldn't say atomic, but they're very programmatic things, right? You start a process and it goes through a set of steps, and eventually those steps should end. The only way to prevent a program from stopping is you have to go through those steps and then make it go back to a certain point and go back to a certain point and go back to a certain point. Now, the, the premise of that is, you know, is a loop, right? 
this is the idea of looping in a program and this is why things like operating systems don't just turn off this is why you can do other things in windows because it's designed to stay in this infinite loop or stay in this scheduled loop and it ensures it ensures that you can do other things on your program you know or sorry within your program or your operating system but when i say fuzzing can be used against every you know every programming language it can and like things like infinite loops or different types of differential analysis is a good is a good way of sort of is a good thing to sort of understand too is that there will be bugs and fuzzing is useful now the next step is why i saw well the next step is related to the if statement so has anyone ever seen i mean i imagine some of you would have has anyone ever seen what a reverse engineered program looks like cool cool i imagine I imagine a lot of people haven't so i'm going to go into that so i'm going to use this example if statement to do it so if no one's ever seen c code before this is what c code looks like right um you typically in compiled code you have a main function that you're going to call into and when i say call into the, your, your operating system is going to load this program and it's going to look for this main function and it's going to run whatever we give it here. So this is the first time that the program executes our own bit of the program to perform some actions. Now in this case, I've there's a you know a argument called argc or argument count and its job is to just check if this is less than three, it will return this value. If this is greater or equal to three, it will return this value. So this is what I mean by an if statement. This is one branch of the program, and this is another branch of the program. And this fundamentally is the only thing computers really do. Um, I, I generally tell people that the difference between sort of computers isn't in their ability to do certain tasks it's in their ability to do certain tax tasks quickly and how much energy they use. So, you know, you've heard of Intel processors. Intel processors are used within, you know, data centers and big servers where there's access to a lot of power. However, things like ARM processors exist within mobile devices such as your mobile phone because they have a different energy usage profile to an Intel processor. So even though there are different types of computers, in this example, ARM and Intel, they still can perform the same actions as one another because they have these basic core principles baked in to the processor. And, and, and the principle of each, each thing or each computer being able to do the same thing or the same set of operations as another is what Turing completeness is. It's the idea that there is a theoretical model for how a computer should look or a theoretical op, you know set of operations that different computers can perform and because of that if you can you know these computers if it, if you do call it a computer they actually do the same things essentially they just do them in different you know they do them in different time and they use different amounts of energy to do it but fundamentally they're the same so this is why I say, you know, the idea of a branch statement is so important because branch statements have to exist in every single type of computer you've got. And this is a really basic one, right? It has two paths through the program. Like I said, I can either return by this value or I can return by this value. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, as I said, you know, my this is my this is my source code file. As I displayed to you, it is just a a text file that I can read. But the other important thing to say is when I give this to a compiler, so when I turn it from you know source code into an actual program to run, is the compiler is going to be able to understand what that source code means and it's going to turn it into machine code. So the compiler I'm going to use for this case is the new C compiler, also known as GCC. And what that's going to do is it's going to read a text file. So I'm going to give it the text file main.c and I'm going to tell it I want you to build me a program or build me an executable called main. So I now have this program called main but there was no print function in it so it's not going to perform any action differently. I could go back in here and change this to, let's get rid of this, 
uh, what was that? The minus one, I think. Was it minus one, I believe? Uh, and this was just zero. So I can gonna recompile that program. Remember, compile compiler takes my plain text file here, which is written in C, and it outputs a machine binary here. So now, if I run it as main, if you remember, if the amount of arguments I pass to it is less than three, it'll return minus one. But if it's equal to three or larger than three, it'll return zero. So now I can pass arguments to main by there's one argument, there's two arguments. So technically that's three, this is two arguments because I'm actually passing this argument as well as this one, so that's one. So you've got one argument, two argument, three arguments. And because in this first situation here, I passed three arguments to it, we passed that first check. It says there is more than three arguments, so we're going to run this bit of code and we're going to ignore this bit of code. Is everyone okay with that idea, of, like just that description of branch statements? Cool. Now what's nice about this really trivial example is I can actually take this binary off my computer and I'm going to reverse engineer it. Uh, let me just go grab it. Example if statement. Let's get to load it into binary ninja. Just give it a second to load. Here binary ninja is cool. Just going to load that binary. Cool. So this is that same program, but now reverse engineered. So I said before that, you know, this, this, this bit of, let's go up here. So like I said before, this text is going to be turned into a machine code binary. And I've now loaded that binary within my, um, within my uh, disassembler. Um, I use binary ninja. And this is the physical code that is being executed by the processor under the hood. This is what that compiler has turned my, you know, my nice text into. Now, these different instructions are called assembly instructions. They mean different things. So a good example is um, move means move. Sub means subtract. They have different, they have different meanings. And they perform different actions. Now, the nice thing about, yep. I've got a limitation that's as much as I can zoom in. Is everyone okay with that? No, it's just Evan's eyes then. Sorry, Evan. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, that, that source code file was essentially turned into, you know, these instructions. So these on the left are addresses, don't worry about this. But these are the actual instructions that are being performed. Now, the job of a computer, as I said, or the job of a processor, is it just takes in that first instruction. Once it's finished, it goes to the next one. And all a, all a processor wants to do is just go down in order until it hits, an, you know, until it exits whatever it's doing and stops. That's its only job. So I can actually, but the, ah, so here's the really important thing to note. So before when I said that we've got two different paths through this program, we can either go down this direction or we can go down this direction. You can very visibly see that here because there is actually only two paths down this program. This is a decision it's making to either go down this 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 side or it's going to go down this side. So that's important. That program had two paths and two ways to go through it, two different execution uh, directions. And like I say, this is branch statements because like if you imagine this is a tree and this was the top of the tree, there's a branch going off in this direction and there's a branch going off in this direction. Now I can I can actually change this to a high level value so for you guys to for you guys to see it. So if we go back to that main function here, we check is this value less than three? Now you could also change that to is this value greater than two, right? Does everyone understand the idea? Because if it's less than three, this is the check that it's less than three. That also is the same as checking if it is greater or equal to two, right? Is everyone okay with that? 
because you've got two types of you've got two types of um, values it can be it can be from you know minus and infinity but let's just start at zero to make it easy it can be zero one and two or it can be you know three four five all the way up to infinity right so this is the difference so when I said if we're checking that this value is within this side or within the other side we could also check is this value greater than or equal to two because if it's sorry equal to three because if it's greater or equal to three or just greater than two actually is probably a better way of putting it because if it's greater than two then it must be on this side whereas the check that I performed before was is it less than three because if it's less than three then it's on this side so when I'm talking about the difference between you know I would say basic integer comparisons or basic number comparisons is that you have this idea you have it can either go down this path on the right or this path on the left and you can represent that in two ways in this circumstance is this value here greater than two so this is greater than two or is this value less than three if it's less than three it's on the left hand side if it's greater than two it's on the right hand side now what my compiler has done here and I actually like this example are you going to say something about Well, I mean, integers are real numbers, right? They're just a subset. So that, I mean, that that's an incredible, yeah, so that's an incredibly concept topic to get into. So floating point values and perfect representation on computers. That That's why I'm using integers, right? It can only be whole numbers. You can't have fractions in this, in this principle, but cheers for noting that. So, you know, integer, you know, it's a whole valued number. I'm, I'm aware that integers are also minus, but for this case, just to make it simple, um, I'm using 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So those are, the, those are two different checks you can make. And if we come back into Binary Ninja, you can see that it's actually not checking if it's less than 3. It's now decided to check it if it's greater than 2. Now, this is things that compilers do, is they read your code and they change it under the hood because they're actually quite good at being able to improve the efficiency of your of your program so this is one of the things it's done why it's done it don't ask me i have no idea but this is just one of the things i wanted to be, be just to make the point of so this is what i would just to describe the interface as well quickly um the correct terminology for one of these things or this for the way this diagram is a graph now these boxes or these nodes, whatever you want to call them, are vertexes or nodes or boxes, whatever you want to call. And these lines in between them are called edges. Now I use edges and nodes most commonly. So if I use the term node, what I'm actually referring to is one of these blocks. If I use the term edge, I'm talking about one of these lines. Is everyone okay with that? Cool. So, you know, in both circumstances, we either would print minus one or we'd print the value uh, zero. So what's happened here as well is another optimization the compiler's performed is it's actually changed my print function to a puts function. It essentially does the same thing, but it's just it's just done another optimization for me. So just people can just so people don't get confused. But that's what it's doing. I start off on this first node and I can either go down this edge depending on the value I give it, arg c is greater than two, or I can go down this value if it's different. Now, if I actually go to this data here, oh God, I can't see, it's all actually in strings, isn't it? What is it, control shift, uh, control shift s, I believe. Uh, but I'm not able to read, am I? This data is, ah, there we go. So this data on the left-hand side, I'm not sure if you can see it, and I can't actually zoom in on this, Evan, so I, or Mark, so I apologise. No, Evan, you were the one with the problems. But this value here is minus one, and this value here is zero. So this value is actually printing minus one, whereas this value here, sorry, is printing zero, and this value here is printing minus one. So, you know, it looks a bit different, but this is actually, uh, I believe this is minus one, and this is zero just to make it clear. So like I said, there is two paths through this program and that's an important thing to, to, to understand. And the, the way we differentiate between paths is 
these branch statements, right? We have a branch statement that can go in this direction, a branch statement that can go in this direction, but when we reverse engineer the code, it can either go in this direction, right, or it can go in this direction, left. This is another important concept I want people to understand. So everyone okay with that? Yep. Uh, uh, so the example was, it was, let me just get rid of this. Yeah, we can go in if or else, right? So this is, like I said, branch statement. That's what, like I said, that's what it actually means. This is a tree, right? Some sort of tree, and it can branch this direction or branch this direction. Now, this value here is minus minus one. So, if I, if the argument or the argument count or arg c is less than three, uh, then it will go down the right hand path. If it's, what was the other one? If it's so, if that was great, I can't remember the way. It's getting confused now. Yep, so if that was less than three, not great. So if it's less than three, it goes down this path. If it's greater than three or, or equal to three, it goes down this left-hand side. So there is only two directions it can go. It can either choose this direction or choose that direction. Is that okay? It just means argument count. It's 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 unimportant, um, but I will I will tell you it's uh, unimportant to the example. So when you run a program, right? So this is me running a program. Yeah, is it's it's I provide an argument. So actually, let me just do this. So here, so when I run this program, I can specify values after it. Okay. So when I specify a value after it, this is an argument to that that program. So if I specify two arguments, that's two arguments to that program. So that's what an argument is. So I've got you know first argument, second argument. So the argument count is how many arguments are being passed. So it's not the arguments themselves, it's how many arguments are being passed. Now in this example, this first thing here, when I run the program, counts as an argument. It's a paradigm that Linux uses. This second one is the second argument, and this third one is the third argument. So this is why you see the difference between behavior. So if I run it with one argument, or two arguments, then it will run one way. If I give it three arguments, it will print out a different value. So this is all the argument count is, is it's physically looking at my you know, my computer when I run this and it's counting how many things I pass into it. Does that answer your question? Cool. So this is what argc is, right? It's just doing that count. And like I said, if it's uh, greater than, no, less than three, it goes down right. If it's greater than three, it goes down left. So this is a really important concept to understand. And this is, and remember that when you're actually, you know, entering the code, underneath the you know in the you know when you're you're actually executing the code in the processor you're actually performing or executing raw machine code in this case this is it intel x86 64 but this is essentially what's happening so it's going to make a comparison statement for this value here and if it you know if it's less than three again it goes down the right hand side if it's less if it's greater than three it get or greater than equal to three it goes down this left hand side if it's less than three it goes down the right hand side i said that backwards but you know this is what's actually being executed by the processor now a really nice thing about this is that when we have this idea of the compiler so i'll just draw you know let's just use gcc because it's my go-to Remember, I had this, you know, test C file or main.c, whatever I called it. So this is our actual text file. Remember, this is our text file or, you know, source file. And we're going to pass in this source file into this compiler. And this compiler is going to spit out some binary for our specific architecture. In this example, x86, 64. It's going to spit out this binary that we can now actually run on our program or run on our computer and we can actually execute the code and this is what we're reverse engineering so when i've done the inspection here is it's actually you know these three blocks sorry these four blocks you know with these edges in between if i just draw a thing around here so this is what it looks like under the hood and we start from the top and we go down and based on the argument we can either go right or left and this is this is the actual binary this is what the binary actually looks like however what's really nice about this 
and this is a really important this is the really important thing I wanted to say about this is that when we turn this source code or this text file pass it into the compiler and we turn it into the binary so when we're you know performing this process here we're actually free to alter the code as it goes through this process we can change what these blocks actually do and we can change the behavior of the program is everyone okay with that idea you can edit the stream of instructions I wouldn't say the compiler you edit you can change the stream of instructions as they're being executed oh sorry as they're being compiled and executed so no not within test.c it will be within the compiler the change will happen although you're, you're although you're not necessarily changing the compiler you're just changing it as the instructions are being executed so you'll edit you can edit it in a few places um so the way that they the way they use it in here um i, I don't want to say that you have to compile it because that implies that you can only do this with compiled code but in this circumstance what afl does is it sort of puts on like a pseudo wrapper around the compiler and it and, and it just performs different actions so it basically leaves gcc or the underlying compiler to do most of the work for it but it alters instructions as they go through and the instructions that it alters are things like you know that it, things like this comparison statement or the you know this this jump statement this is j stands for jump so it can you know it jumps to different areas in the code so it'll be looking for these types of instructions as it's being executed sorry as it's being compiled and as it's going through this process based on you know whether or not it's a jump instruction or not, it's free to go in and change the behavior of that code you okay with that anyone else have any questions so this i would say this is just like a wrapper i would I, it, Yeah, so like I said, remember source code, clear text, is being turned into a binary. Most of the underlying work is just is done by GCC. However, we've put a little wrapper around it that as this code is being changed, is we look for these specific instructions. And these specific instructions I said are going to be these instructions that start with J, right? J means jump. So any place that this program can make a decision and change the direction it's going in it's going to look for these instructions and it can it, then it's once it's found these instructions it's going to replace them with something else oops is that okay everyone understand cool excellent now this is an important concept to to, to uh just just for everyone to understand and that, that that's like probably one of the most important things to get What's really nice about being able to do this is because we've written this wrapper and we can, you know, inject code into here. I'll just write inject to make it clear. Because we can inject code into there or, or alter, is now, instead of compiling the code directly, we're free to add in bits of information to this code. We can now add in our own bits of code. So a really one way that AFL works is whenever it sees one of these jump statements, remember it begins with a J, is it adds in a little preamble within that code block. And when I refer to code block, this is code, it's in a block, this is a code block. So here in a code block, what AFL will do, or this compiler will do, or we, we're, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say AFL specifically because other things can do this, is we're going to tack on a bit of code at the start, right here and here, and what that's going to do is, as it get executed, the processor is now going to record which one of these blocks it went through. You okay with that? Now this this idea is really powerful, because what we can do now is let's say we let's say we just want to run the program normally, right? And I'm just going to name these blocks to make it easy for everyone to understand. So these blocks are called one, two, three, four. And remember, now when the program executes, is it's going to record which blocks 
it's actually gone through. The, pro the CPU is going to be able to say, look, I'm in block number one, I've gone through block number one, then I've gone through block number two. So like I said, we've got two paths through this program. We can either go right or left, remember? We can either go right or we can go left. Oh, let's make sure it's the right one. Or we can go left. Those are the two options. So this is one, two, two different directions. But because we've added on, or we've tacked on this little bit of code at the beginning, now what's going to happen is when the CPU or the pro or the, pro the process for the operating system actually executes this code block, is it's going to record which blocks it's gone through. So let's let's pick a let's pick a direction, right? Let's say the value is less than three. So if the value is less than three, we're always going to go through the first block because we've always got to start at the beginning. So we say we've gone through block number one. Next, it's going to make a decision, and it makes the decision to go through block number two. So we go through block number two. And finally, we go to block number three. Right. So we've actually recorded which blocks we've gone through as we've executed the program. Let's, let's try a different value. This time, we're going to go down the left-hand side. So we start at block number one. However, the value is larger than three. So we go to block number four next. And then finally, we finish on block number three. But importantly, because we added these green bits here at the beginning, or these little bits of preamble, with these things tacked on the front, is we can actually differentiate between which direction the program went down. Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? Yes, it's a tracing tool. So, so these these things here are called program tracers. We're able to trace the direction that the the uh, the program got executed, right? And these little bits of green here that I've added on on at the front is what we call instrumentation. So instrumentation. I can't even actually spell instrumentation. I think that's right. Can't spell. So these green bits here are the instruments we inject into that code stream. Remember, remember, I said normally we just have these code blocks that go through the compiler. However, because we've put a little wrapper around the compiler this time, we're going to inject these bits of green or these green blocks here or these bits of instrumentation. And what that instrumentation is going to give to us is the ability to record which of these code blocks we go through. Is everyone okay with that concept? Yes. So these things here are paths, right? And like, like then I said, this is really good for being able to record which path we've gone down. And that's what's really powerful. So this is what led to the next sort of level of fuzzing. And I'll just give you a demonstration of this. So I'm going to actually change the program I want to use. So let me just switch my screen. So this time I'm going to go into the example jump. So this is the source code here. So what's going to happen with this source code? Again, we've got the main function. This time we're checking to see if that argument count is equal to 10. If the argument count is equal for 10, then it's going to print out the values from 0 to, uh, I guess, 9 in order, and then it's going to return. So if I just compile that, so make, and I run it, it's not going to return anything. However, this time, I'm going to give it 10 parameters. And because I've given it 10 parameters, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's going to print the values from 0 to 9. So based on this behavior, it's going to perform a different action, right? Based on what, what data I give it. If I give it one more value, it's not going to print anything. If I give it one less value, it's not going to print anything. It needs to be given or provided exactly 10 values. Remember, zero. we start counting at 0 here and go to 9, which is 10. Because we're giving it 10 values, it's going to perform a different action. So if I just go to here... <laughs> And that's what we're doing. We're checking, is this equal to 10? If it's equal to 10, we're going to print out all the characters from 0 to 9. 
Cool. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to reverse engineer this instead. So let me just grab this. And we'll load this up into Binary Ninja. So I can find it. So this will look a bit different, but essentially it will be the same. So I just come here. So we go into the main function. This is what it looks like. So the first check is to check if the value is equal to 10. And this is the check to see if the value equals to 10. Now, if people don't know their hexadecimal off by a heart like me, 0xA is the number 10. So this value here is the number 10. So it's doing the check to see if this value equals to 10. And then eventually it will come down. In, if you know if it is exactly equal to 10, it will come down this direction here. And it will hit this while loop. And then it will print out all the characters from 0 to 9. So it will spin around this loop 10 times. If the value isn't equal to 10, it will skip this entire thing on this left hand side here and just go to the end and exit. That's, so this is the difference between the program. Again, this is the disassembly version of it. And this is all. This is the pure machine code. This is the higher level overview, just to give people a, a better sort of understanding of it. So this is the high level code. And like I said, if it's 10, this direction. If it's not 10 or any other value, this direction. What I'm gonna do now is, instead of using GCC like I did before, Remember main C, that's my source code file, the output main. I'm going to use AFL GCC. Now AFL GCC, this is just a, that little wrapper. Remember what I said here? This little green bit around the side here is just that wrapper. And this is what AFL is providing, or the, the AFL compiler. So the AFL compiler is providing this little bit of green round here. It's providing this wrapper. And its job is going to be looking for anywhere that has these you know these jump statements these branch statements look they all begin with j it's going to be looking for these locations because wherever these locations are is where the behavior of the program can potentially change so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to use the afl gcc compiler remember turn the source code into a binary and i'm going to build it and what's really nice about it is it said it's told me it's instrumented three locations so it said there's three different places within that binary it's gone in and it's gone in and added code and i'm hoping we should be able to figure it out so the first value if i just see this is equal to that let's have a look at the actual binary under binary ninja so it should instrument three different locations so one two three so because there is these three jump values in the program it's going to instrument these locations it's looking for these jump instructions so it's put it's placed a bit of code on here it's going to look for this and place a bit of code there and it's going to look for this and place a bit of code there so if i now come out and just call this main trace I'm just going to name it a bit differently again we've got three locations it's been instrumented and i just pull this value out and i load this instead Remember, this is the same program. We're going to load the same program again. But this time, we've slightly modified some of the underlying instructions. Oh, God, that's horrible. Oh, there we go. So, this looks completely different to the program before. But you can see the difference here is that we have references to AFL that have now been included. So we have different directions that this program can go in, but this time we've actually, the compiler has added in three distinct areas. Remember, one, two, three, three different areas that has been instrumented. And when I said instrumented, I mean it's added its own little bit of green code here. And what that's going to be able to do is it's going to be able to record the direction of execution we can go down. So everyone happy with that? Everyone happy with when I describe, you know, binary ninja here, that these three different areas have been instrumented and we've added code in these different directions. Oh God, uh, a bit horrible. Cool, 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 cool. Can't need to zoom out. 
to find that. Okay, that's probably better. Excellent. So let me just come to my notes. Yep. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question, and uh, I'd love to give you a really comprehensive answer. Um, so to re to discuss it really basically, so when I change the view here, um, if anyone else gets confused, I apologise. So this is the disassembly, right? This is the pure machine code. Now, this, I wouldn't say it's C, but there's a concept of an intermediate language, and I won't describe what that is, but you have different levels and different, like, each level you go up is a more high-level description of the one prior. So this one here, the pure disassembly, is what's actually being executed. Right? This is the source code, at least how binary ninjas interpreted it. What we're doing here is when I go to low level, is it's in, it, the code's got slightly smaller because it's been able to abstract some of these functions away. So it's been able to abstract, um, you know, that this is an if statement, right? So whereas before we had a comparison, then a jump state, you know, a jump statement, this time we've abstracted it because we know it's an if statement, right? We've interpreted that those instructions represent an if statement. They won't always be that, but this is interpreted. And then the next level we go up, it interprets some more data as well. So again, it's gone a bit slower. And this time it's actually it's actually picked up the instruction. Before it didn't have the instruction, right? It just said if EDI. This time it's picked up, sorry, I won't say the instruction. It's picked up the name of the variable. It's saying argc, which is also EDI. Then finally, we can abstract it away even more, which looks really horrible. I just need to zoom out and find the main function. So this is just setting everything up. Oh my God, this is horrible. Is there an if statement? I can't actually find any. Oh, there we go. But this time, it's actually just made it the pure if statement. It's not telling us anything about the registers. It's just saying this is an if statement. So each level we go up, this is what it's doing. And the high level overview is as close to C as you're really going to get. It's not perfect C because you have these compiler optimizations. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. The disassembler is doing its, jo its jo the job as best as possible to try and go back to C code. But I'm going to try and stick as... Yeah, sorry. You, you can. Um... It can get very complicated and you've got optimizations and sometimes C code doesn't exist for what you want to do. And there's loads of situations and scenarios. However, you know, I like the disassembly view a lot of the time because it's actually what's being executed. And now you can have arguments that um, you could have, you know, malware that resists disassembly that, you know, tries to break binary ninja or break IDRA or break Ghidra. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. But just, just know that when I'm changing views, it's the same code. I'm just changing like how high level it is just to just to make it so easier to understand. So in this case, pure disassembly, right? And now I've completely lost where I was. Sorry about that, everyone. Just wanted to go over some quick point. Ah, cool. Like I said, we've now got this concept of, you know, instrumenting locations, adding these bits of code before we actually execute the binary, because now we can record which direction the, the, the thing has actually gone in. Is everyone okay with that? Cool. So this is this is the sort of next generation of fuzzing, I would say, that came out. So if the first, you know, if the first, if we go back and I say, you know, the first generation was, you know, this idea of dumb mutation fuzzing, and what we were doing here is we were just taking random values and we're just throwing them at the program to, or the server or the program to see how it would act differently. And the second type was we want to do it a bit better. What we're going to do in this circumstance is we're going to create these configuration files to see or to tell the fuzzer what the structure of the data looks like to try and get even deeper into that program. And the idea this time is to you know, actually manually or, or sort of semi-automatedly tell it which bits of data are important. However, now with this case here that I'll go into the actual the, the description of it next is that this time we've actually managed to put this instrumented code on 
the program, right? So this is the first stage of it. And that's what you guys are telling me you're all understanding. Now, what's really nice about this is if I draw a, let's draw a, I, I guess, a you know, a different sort of perspective for, for a program, right? So instead of squares, I'm just using circles. It just makes it a bit simpler for me. Uh, you know, so this, you know, this here could be a different program, right? So like I had with, um, you know, Binary Ninja, and Binary Ninja had, you know, these blocks. Let's try and find a more complex function. Let's not have it there. God, these are terrible. There's got to be something here that's more complicated. Nothing complicated enough. That's really annoying. No, oh, well, we're going to have to stick with main. Start now. So, you know, this is... <clears throat> so, just what I've drawn down here, you know, just pretend these code blocks here are the circles, and, you know, these lines or these edges are the, the different directions the program can go into. Cool. So, that's what I'm drawing now. So the idea is that I want, want to make people understand is whereas before we were throwing random data at this program, now we've actually tagged on a bit of code at each one of these locations and it's able to tell us which direction or which path we've taken through the program. Now this is really powerful because now let's say I want to let's say I just want to chuck some random data on it and let's say you know that first bit of data we pick is the letter A, right? And remember, this is still a HTTP server. So this is still HTTP. Because this, you know, value A doesn't make any sense to this, you know, this thing, there's going to be a check. And there's going to be a check, you know, right at the beginning of the program. And this check, when this, this A, just this single A, gets sent to this program, right at the beginning of this program, it's going to turn around, it's going to read this value, and it's going to go, I don't understand what that means. And it's just going to reject it. So it's just going to reject, at this first location, it's going to reject that value. However, the next, we're going to mutate the value. We're going to change the value. So next, we pick the value B, right? Pick the value B. We send the value B to the program. Again, it gets rejected. Eventually, we're going to keep doing this over and over and over again very quickly. This time, we get to the letter G. Now, G is significant because in HTTP, you know, there is such a thing as get. So the first value here is, you know, the letter G, and we're now sending the letter G into this program. So we send the letter G into that program, right? This time, it gets accepted by this first thing, this by this first block. Because it's passed that first check and it doesn't get it, it doesn't get rejected, it now progresses onto the second check. And let's say the second check is this node here. Remember, we've gone to this first node, it's passed the first check, now we've gone to the second node. So the second node is going to check the next value. It's going to check what comes next after G. Well, nothing comes after G, right? Because there's nothing there. So what we're actually going to do this time is we're going to reject, reject it. But the difference here is that we've actually rejected it at this place in the program. We haven't rejected it at this location. And if you remember to what I said before, because we're tracing which blocks this program can go through, if this is block number one and this is block number two, we will have a trace that will say we've actually gone through block one first, and then this time we've gone through block two. So we know that when we send in the letter A, we only ever go to block one. If we ever go to the send in the letter B, we only ever get to block one. But this time when we've sent the value G, E, right? Oh, sorry. When we've sent the value G, we've actually gone through block one and block two. Does everyone understand that idea? Cool. So this is the whole idea of instrumented fuzzing. And remember what I said. There's instruments that sit within each one of these little nodes that are going to record which direction we go in. Anyway, we keep generating more data. We keep creating more, longer strings. This time, you know, eventually we get to a point where we send in the values GE, right? We send in the values GE. Again, we send in that value GE. It gets accepted. This time, it gets sent to the second value. However, because there's an E, it doesn't get rejected and it gets accepted. So it gets accepted here. Now, because there's a GE, 
it goes to this third value here and goes to this third one here but there's no t and because there's no t it now gets rejected but the important bit here is that when we've actually executed this program this time we've recorded the trace one two three now each time we get further and further down into the program we're going to generate a new path through the program we're going to generate a new path through this binary and we're because we're recording them all the time we know what bits of data are significant we know that the value a and we know the value b is insignificant because when we give it the value a and b we only ever hit this first code block and every time we ever hit this code first block all we ever do is record that we've only ever hit the first code block it just comes back and goes one 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 you're not getting any further however when we hit the letter g we get through two go blocks so we know that that program when it gets the letter g it's done something significant that g is more important than that a or that b and we keep going right we keep doing this and eventually we send in the letter g or the letters g e this time we generate the trace one two three and because we generate the trace one two three we know that this g e is more significant than the g on its own and again we do it over and over again and eventually we send in the string get and when we send in the string get to the program it gets accepted you know one step further right it gets accepted to you know to this third block and because it's a valid value you know it might it might go all the way through the program for instance but this important thing here is this time we've gone through code block one code block two code block three code block four and code block five so we've done one two three four five and we've traced the direction we've gone in and because we've been able to trace the direction we've gone in we know that this word get is more significant than the previous values is everyone okay with that idea cool what what's really good about this and this is what this is what this, this is how the step goes further is now we don't actually have to describe in a file in a configuration file or a model file we don't actually have to describe or tell it that this get value is you know is important the program has figured it out on all, all on its own right we could have we you know we could have saved some time by saying get is an important value and you can still do that with the fuzzy you can still give it values and you can give it hints however we don't actually have to tell it it's managed to figure it out all on its own and this is an important concept now the reason why it's really useful is because there are really small edge cases and there's a lot of different you know there's a lot of different paths we could potentially go through and because of that and we don't always know the precise structure or we don't know the precise structure of the you know the format exactly it would take a very long time to understand it but how we read this is what i said before how humans read that data format or how humans read you know a HTTP request is different to how it's interpreted by a processor computers think differently to us right they interpret things differently because they are they exist in a different like in a different plane they just they can operate on numbers really well because just because someone understands HTTP really well doesn't mean that a computer is going to see it the same way and vice versa so this is what's really powerful about things like AFL is they're able to do this they're able to send these bits of data in and then it's able to record the directions that the program goes down now there's three types of things that are going to happen with this program and this is where, where it goes back to pure computer science and our ensuring number one the program's either going to stop at some point that program's either going to stop or crash and you know the generic term for that is halting right or that program is going to continue in, inf in an infinite loop forever right those are the general two things that a computer can do it can either stop or it can run forever and that people like Alan Turing proved back in the 40s and 50s, well, 40s and 50s, sorry, is that it's impossible to tell, you know, in a generic way, whether or not a computer is going to stop or whether or not it's going to continue forever. And this is a fundamental problem with fuzzing, is that we're not going to be able to infinitely generate random bits of data to try and test this program in every single way. But we can do better than a unit test. Now, unit tests are still really, really good things. And they're still really, really useful. Fuzzing is a really good way to prevent zero days and bugs that developers and even people like me miss. This is the point of fuzzing. 
These are tools that we use to automate a lot of this stuff away. And the, and I tell you what, the way, the place fuzzing works really well is within organizations. If you're a development team or you're like right, you know, or you're a tester of some sort, if you can integrate this automatic testing, not unit testing, this type of fuzz testing, I would say for critical critical functions, you're going to find zero days before they go out the door. You're going to be able to fix bugs. You're going to find weird user quirks and user errors. Because I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. If you don't fuzz your code and you're a developer, you can be damn sure I'm going to find it and I'm going to break it. Because I'm going to break it because you know I live to just break things and that's my job right i live to find your mistakes if you guys don't fuzz your own code i'm going to do it for you the difference is i you know i'm not saying me personally or the attacker could potentially sell that bug or post it online or you may even have to pay a premium in terms of a book bounty to get it this is the power of you know the power of fuzzing integrate this type you know fuzzing within your you know continuous development or continuous and you know integration life cycle and you'll be like you know your head will be you'll, you'll be miles ahead of your competition and this is what people like microsoft and amazon do and a lot of really big development shops and you know places they do this type of testing because this type of testing tests unknown situation scenarios you're going to get yourself into so this is the like i said just wanted to make everyone understand this is the idea of instrumented based fuzzing have you ever seen this before mark i'd be interested to see if you know So, so, I mean, I mean, so. I mean that's so that the so AI is to solve small problems is what I say it it solves really small things and like when you know you have these big AI engines that's because they're like a collection of you know models individual models that solve simple problems that together do something so in a really good example for this that I was describing is that you've generally got three things you can do for fuzzers number one you can um, you can run more tests per second, right? You can make it go quicker. Number two, you can give it better data. So, you know, whereas I just, you know, whereas I said here, we can give it a configuration file. You can still do that with instrumented fuzzing. It's not required, but it gives it a head start. It gives it a nudge. And the third way, and this is probably one area that I really, this is one area I really enjoy, is the idea of um, Boolean satisfiability theorems. Uh, satisfiability moduli theories they're not artificial intelligence they're not neural networks in any way but what they can do is they can reason about constraints within source code oh, shit. they can reason about constraints within source code and you can mathematically put these constraints in here and it can find different paths through the source code now they work they work really powerful together so the way i've seen ai work in fuzzing is that they, you know, you give it a lot of this data and it learns what the data format is. But that is a tool within a fuzzer, right? It is not AI on its own. The second, cool. Um, God, I can't remember what I was going to say now. So, <laughs> no, it's fine. It's a good question. I, you know, I love good questions. So, like I said, the AI solves that really specific problem, right? That's what it does. You can have static analysis tools that I can go into a lot of depth. I'm not going to go into it. The other thing, like I said, with um, you know satisfiability theory, like if you've got a particular, generally arithmetic operations, if you've got a really nasty bit of code or you've got a special value, theoretically, you could just leave this running forever, right? And it would eventually, given enough time, it would hit that specific value. However, what you can do with things like symbolic execution is you can either run this entire program as a mathematical model and remember it's a model so it depends how you best you represent it or how you interpret it or if i and this is what things like oh god i can't remember the name is now it was a type of afl no it's gone what the way it worked is that if it had a particularly nasty constraint here or a, you know a value it would try and solve it and it would give you another test case to go back and at least get past here. So if you've if you've got a bit of code you can never get through here, right? It will try and solve that. 
Now the problem with things like AI and state space, and or sorry, the problem with AI and probably things like um, uh, SMT solving or symbolic execution or concolic execution is that you have this idea of state space explosion. Is there is so many variations that this like exponentially becomes very complicated very quickly. Now another way you could use AI, right, is not necessarily in this whole fuzz test, but is if you get to a certain point that you can't bypass, you might be able to write an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm, some sort of reinforcement learning or, you know, actual deep learning model to try and bypass. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah. I mean, how, I mean, I would pref I prefer the symbolic execution model here. So that is, you know, the third the third case that I said is like being more clever with mathematics. And that's that's an area I really enjoy. It's really hard, but I really enjoy it. So that's the other way. So just sort of applying an AI engine is sort of a bit of a um, bit of a misnomer statement, if I would say. It's sort of like not really describing or asking the correct thing, because like you can use AI in these like specific things, right? And solve these specific problems. And like I said. You know, you've described trend analysis and it works really well. Trend analysis works really well. If I go and get 10,000 different types of requests or I go and get 20,000 different types of file, it can learn the generic structure of what that file is supposed to look like. You know, AFL can probably discover most of it on its own, but AI might be able to provide a good set of test data to start from. And that's where I've seen AFL, uh, American Fuzzy Lock. All right. So, yeah, I, but yeah, sorry, I'll describe that. So AFL is is um, is this idea, this or at least it was this idea of instrumented fuzzing. It's this idea of you know sending data into the program, and it will go through here, and it will test or sorry, it was able to record which direction the program's gone in. So AFL is the tool that does that for you. Now AFL stands for American Fuzzy Lock, and for those people that are particularly keen on rabbits. American Fuzzy Lock is a really type of fuzzy rabbit. Lab what? Lop, lop, lop. Lop, lop, L-O-P. American Fuzzy Lock. You can Google it. You look, you pro if, you, if you type in American Fuzzy Lock into Google, you're going to get a rabbit. Um... One, all book, all code has buggers in it, right? If you ain't doing this, there's going to be more of them. Like if if I if I like so a really good example is if I'm doing a test for someone or I'm getting a bit of code and I say, can I have access to your source code? And they go, no. I'm going to think one, you know, I'm I'm going to go, I'm going to think in the back of my mind, you're not giving me that source code because it doesn't look very nice. Like there's something wrong with it. You don't think it's very good. And a lot of people that do this, they sort of. They depend too much on obfuscation as a protection mechanism. Like, if you don't know the source codes, right, then how are you going to be able to attack it? And like I've demonstrated, you can reverse engineer source code. It's harder than just reading the source code itself, but you can reverse engineer it. However, these techniques that I've described, it doesn't give a shit what your source code looks like, right? It's just going to try. It's just going to try and see stuff. Now... This this method that I'm describing at the moment with, with the compiler is, yes, you need access to the source code. In the fourth week, I'm going to show you, you don't need access to the source code. You can either, you know, you can hit Windows programs, you can hit Linux programs without access to the source code. You can still do this. If you are not doing this as a developer, I guarantee you're having more bugs because you're not doing it. And not just security bugs, you know, just little sort of maybe... You know, little bugs that exist in your code, little bugs that developers find, oh, sorry, your users find, you will have bugs in here. This is a, if people, if everyone in the world did this in some way, and, I, and the other thing to understand is you don't want to fuzz everything, right? You don't want to take every single function and attack it. What you want to do is you want to find critical functions. Anytime you're reading a bit of data that comes off a network, you want to be attacking that particular function because that is an important function. Because that data is originating externally or it's originating from a different processor, that would be one area that I would say fuzz. Go after it, attack it. And and when I say this is really powerful for developers to use, that's because you know people like me 
I don't understand what your software does. If I'm going to fuzz this, even if I have access to the source code, and hopefully some of you guys will go away and try this, is one of the first things you have to do is just understand what the thing's doing before you can attack it. Now, my job is not to understand exactly what you were thinking when you were doing it, but it's much harder for me to attack the source code because I don't understand it. If you understand the source code and you've got access to it, you can both run this faster and it's much easier for you to integrate. And what I generally say is like, if you've got a, if you've got a unit test for something, if you can write a fuzz test as well, and I'll, and I'll demonstrate over the next coming weeks of what this actually physically looks like, but if you can do that at the same time, it's really simple and you can say, when you know when we go and build the program over the weekend, what we're going to do this, you know, what we're going to do instead is we're going to just have it do some basic fuzz testing for forty eight hours because forty eight hours of fuzz testing is better than no hours of fuzz testing. That's the way I look at it. You know, people have the different sort of paradigms, but if like a really good example is Google that, with Chromium or something, is they've got they've got thousands thousands of different functions that people fuzz. They've got thousands of different machines that are fuzzing simultaneously, just hitting Chromium. And this is why you don't readily find bugs in things like Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Word. You used to a very long time ago, right? However, Microsoft got wise and went, Christ, people are fuzzing our equipment. They're fuzzing our software. What we're going to do this time is we're actually going to, you know, integrate this into our development lifecycle. And the software development lifecycle by Microsoft actually talks about this quite a lot as actually having it as a test, an automated test, but really powerful to use as a developer. I urge every business, if you write developing in some way, do something like this because there are fuzzes that exist for every language. Does that answer your question, Evan? Cool. Yeah. Well, you look at it in two different directions, right? I, th I believe you had a question, Dana. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you can fuzz Ruby. You can. Yep. It it it's complicated, but it's different. But like I said before, Ruby's probably like if if Ruby crashes because of a memory corruption bug, that's because the Ruby the Ruby interpreters there's an actual problem with Ruby. Probably not going to happen. However, every language yeah you can do this for every language. However, Ruby as well, you know you can still have infinite loops right. So. In this situation, what we're going to look for with AFL, and I'll demonstrate that shortly, is we're going to be checking three scenarios. Number one, does it crash? Number two, does it exit cleanly? Or number three, does it get itself in an infinite loop? While Ruby's probably not going to crash, we can do probably two things. Number one, we can test it to see if it gets an infinite loop. And, or, you know, or the second is we can say, it's this program is supposed to behave. We can say it's supposed to behave like this. If we start throwing data at it and we keep recording its behavior, by sending in data, can I get it to behave differently? So it's not just about crashing. Crash, you got to think about crashing as we're just testing to see if the behavior changes. Now, Ruby's not going to crash, but you can be damn sure you can check if the behavior changes. And you can do this for any language. You can do this for interpreted languages, compiled languages, assembly languages. You can do this against processors. People have been doing this against Intel processors, ARM processors. Things like Spectra and Meltdown, this is one of the ways they do it. Now, I've messed around with a operating system called Sushi Roll that tries to abstract this away, and it actually is able to do this type of tracing. So it's actually able, the Intel processor itself, the hardware, is able to trace the direction this goes down. Now, I went to a talk at Black Hat a few years ago, and the guy that was actually fuzzing the Intel processor is he found some hidden instructions that if you sent them into the processor in certain orders, it would actually crash the you know crash crash the processor and cause it to break. Now I don't know about you, but try fixing a bloody Intel processor and see how how you know how easy that is. These things are built years before, you know, millions at a time. If you find a bug in an Intel processor, you can't fix it for five six years, and these things are going to be around for decades. And this exists in hardware. It exists in software. It exists in everything that humans make. And, you know, you can fuzz hardware, like I said. You can fuzz software. You can fuzz network programs. You can fuzz, you know, non-compiled stuff. You can fuzz compiled stuff. Does that answer your question? Cool. 
So this is the idea. Remember, we send in data, we trace which direction it's gone in, we're able to do that. And we can learn new things about the program because we've done this. Now, what I'm going to show you is the sort of, the last thing I'm going to show you is the sort of high level overview of what AFL is actually doing or American Fuzzler. Any fuzzer generally follows this paradigm, but I'm using AFL as the example because it was the first and it's probably the best understood. Number one, so you've got two stages. Number one, I've got my source code, right? Remember, it's that clear text file that I've written that was called test.c. You know, I've written this. It's got some source code. I need to turn this, you know, this, this clear text into a binary I can run on my machine. What we did traditionally with that was with the GCC compiler. But this time, because we won that nice, that nice instrumentation, instead of GCC, we're going to use AFL GCC, which is a utility. So we're going to push this source code through this compiler and out pops a binary. In every other way, it's the same as the original binary that would have been generated just from GCC. But this time, we're just using AFL GCC. I'll actually highlight that just to make it a bit clearer. Remember. So instead of GCC, we're using AFL GCC. And the difference is that this is going to add this nice bits of instrumentation. In. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to prepare the binary in such a way that we're able to attack it. So this is what we do. So number one. Number two, we need to find some way to send to give the program data. Now, AFL works in two ways. You can either send it standard input or it can read a file. I won't go into that this week because it can get very complicated. But the idea is, is I can I can send data in one two ways. I can either just send data to the program or I can make it read a file. So that's how AFL works. So we need to find a way to pass data because we want to run this binary from the beginning to the end. And we either want to give it standard input or we want to make it read a file. And when it goes through this program and each execution it goes through, we're going to record the direction or the execution blocks that it goes through. So the second stage we're going to go through. Uh, actually, I'll show, you, I'll show you what that actually looks like on the screen. It's probably best first. If you've got any questions, now's the time to ask us. This could take a bit of time. So the code I'm going to use this is duct tape. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's used duct tape before. So duct tape is a JavaScript, a small JavaScript interpreter. So it's a bit like Node. So I can run Node, which is a JavaScript interpreter, and I can just type JavaScript into here. I can type one or two. I can type var of r equal i equals two. And then I can type, you know, i times two equals four, because remember, i was two. Or I can type, you know, i times, oops, i times eight. And it's going to say 16. This is a JavaScript interpreter. This is JavaScript code. I'm writing JavaScript code, and it's giving me a value. That's what this is. This is we're doing. Duct tape is a program that's similar. Now I attacked this a few years ago, and I think I got maybe five zero days of CVs from it, just attacking this bit of code. Um, it's used in a lot of IoT applications because it's a really small version. But I'll just give you a demonstration of duct tape, so I can you know set i equal to value of 2. I'm going to write it all on one line for now. And I can say i times 2. So, you know, actually let's do 4. So I'm setting the value of i to equal the number 2. And then I'm times in that value, which is the number 2, by 4. Hit enter. And it's going to say 2 times 4 equals 8. This is JavaScript, right? This is what I'm doing. So the first thing I need to do is actually compile this binary. So if I just remove the binary for now, I'm not going to go into this now, but to pet you have to find a way to compile it. That's the first problem. But this time, you know, this file here is the thing that builds it. This is the actual, this is the, so make files are descriptions of how to build software. They're, instead of me typing on the command line, they're just automated scripts and configuration files. They just let me not have to type in a bunch of commands. So originally, this was, you know, GCC, right? The new C compiler. However, I'm going to change the compiler to be the AFL version. Remember the AFL one that was uh, wrapped around? And I'm going to use the compiler AFL clan class. Now, if GCC stood for the new C compiler, there is another compiler called the C lang. Uh, language. 
I've got a kind of spell language compiler. So C language compiler is cut lang, right? So there is a different compiler. Two of the both of these uh, they take C code and they compile it into binaries, right? So this time instead of using you know GCC, I'm using uh, Clang, and the reason I'm using Clang is just because it's a bit faster and it gives you a bit a, you know more it gives it gives you better access to the data and those data streams as they're being compiled. So all I've done here is remember it. This used to be GCC. I've changed the C compiler. CC stands for C compiler. And I've changed it from GCC, because that is a C compiler, to a different version of a C compiler. But importantly, I've told it to use the AFL version. And remember that AFL version is going to do that nice instrumentation. So this time, I'm going to type make J, uh, sorry, make, and I'm going to say, we want to build the command line file. So you can see here it's using the clan compiler, the AFL version. It's telling me what it's doing. Now what you should see is it's going to come back and say, we've injected a load of nice instrumentation. So whereas before we had three different paths or three different um, bits of instrumentation that got added, here we've got 24,009 bits of instrumentation that have been added. So it's a lot more complicated than that trivial example we used previously. This takes a while, so ask questions. In, yeah, in this, yeah. So you, you can do that. You can instrument every code block in a set, in sort of a sense. It's sort of hard to, where the operating system starts and where things like libc start and stop and start and end um, can be become a bit complicated. But when, the, you know, there, there are valid things like dead code that might exist that the compiler can do. Um, but again, um, you know, we're just instrumenting locations as we go through. So it's instrumented all these different areas. So, you know, we can tell it's working because it's saying, well done, you've instrumented it. So again, you know, we've got this binary that we ran before and you can run it just like normal again. So I can actually just run it and I can type in values, right? Var i equals 10, uh, i times three, and we should expect 30, prints 30. However, the difference is, is that this duct tape binary is now instrumented. Is everyone happy with that? So that was the first step. You need to make sure you can compile it and find a way to pass data. The way we pass data here is we run it and we can type in things into you know the command line and it accepts data. We can't, we, you know, it's not designed to accept a file. There's no way to you know, give it a file. Actually, I don't know if there is, that'd be interesting. Oh no, it does. It can actually read a file as well. So you can either pass it via a file or you can pass it via standard input. Uh, I might just use it via a file, it might be easier. Let's just check that. No, I'll, I'll do it in a bit. Anyway, the point is, is that number one, we compiled the language. Number two, we need to find a way to pass in data, right? So as part of the second of the second stage of it is once we've been able to find a way to pass in data, if I come back here to my desk, we've remember we've done the compilation. It, we haven't used GCC. We've used a slightly different a different compiler. Does the same thing. Does the same instrumentation. But now, next, what we're going to do is we're actually going to run the American Fuzzy Lock, the AFL compiler, right? Now, the first thing we've got to do is give it some input data. And this input data is called a corpus. So what all we're going to do is we're going to create a directory. I like to use the name in because it's easy. I'm going to call a directory called in. And I'm going to put some example, you know, example test cases in here. One, two, three. I'm going to put some example test cases in here. So let's just do that now. I've already got them created, so it's going to say that they've already been created, but I'm going to make a directory called in and another directory called out just to make it simple. They already exist, but that's besides the point. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some initial data into here to start the test, something to work from. You don't always need data to work from. It just makes it just gives the compiler. It gives sorry, it gives the fuzzer a head start. So if I go back into my virtual machine, if I go into this in directory, I'm going to give it, you know, I've already written one add two, so that is valid JavaScript code, right? And then the second bit of JavaScript code is going to be var num equals two, two times four. That, you know, actually, let's just do uh, num times four. This is going to return eight, right? Because that's what it does. But those are two. So in here, this in directory, we've got two test cases. The first one is some JavaScript, and the second one is a slightly different version of JavaScript. And this is just to give the, the um, fuzzer an initial data set to work from. 
We've also created an out directory, but I'll explain that in a sec. So first things first, like I said, we've created this in directory. What the fuzz is going to do is when it loads this data, is it's going to load the first test case, right? It's going to load that first test case. It's going to read it. Then what it's going to do is it's going to spawn that duck binary. So it's going to spawn the binary, duck, D-U-K. It's going to spawn this binary. And remember, this binary is instrumented, so we can record it. So step one, we read in the first test case. AFL is going to change it in its own way. It's going to read that first test case, and it's going to mutate it. It's going to change the value. It's going to add a one in. It's going to add some invalid data. It's going to flip the bits. It's going to flip bytes. But step one, gets loaded by AFL. Step two, AFL is going to mutate that data. Step three, AFL is going to send that data into duck. So one, two, three. Loads the data, mutates it, sends it to duck. Duck is going to do one of two things. It's either going to... I have no idea. Mate, I have no idea. I've never looked it up. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it probably means something I don't know. Yep. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's sort of doing the same thing. You're not actually, so you're not actually, ch you're not changing the browser. You're not changing the server. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, when. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah, you'll change it as this goes through. You, I mean, it's up to AFL, right? AFL, the first thing it's going to do is it's just it's just going to send this test case to make sure it works and does something, right? And then what it's going to do is the next time it comes back, it's going to load it again and it's going to change it. And then it's going to keep changing it and it's going to keep changing it in the middle. It does this all automatically. I'll I'll, I will demonstrate that when the, uh, the uh, screen's on. So like I said, step number one, load the first test case. It's going to change it some way. Step step number two, change it in some way. You know, it's going to add a one. It's going to add an A. It's going to flip some bits, change some bytes. Step number three, sends it to the program. And remember, this program has been instrumented, so we're going to record the trace. We're going to get out some sort of trace file. And the program is going to do one of two things. Well, I'll say one of three things. Number one, it's going to sit in an infinite loop forever, and it's never going to come back. Or number two it's going to come back as either exiting cleanly or it's going to crash. Hopefully it's going to crash because that's where bugs live, right? So it sends some data back and it says, yep, I've returned or I haven't. Either way, AFL is going to record it. The third thing it's going to do is we're going to have an out directory here. Is It's going to place this recording, this trace file, it's going to place it in an output directory. It's going it, to, it actually, that's like, so this output directory log, logs a lot of things. One of the things it does is it logs these traces. Each time a new, you know, a new thing's generated here is it's going to put it in the output directory. It's also going to record, you know, the test cases that it caused crashes, or it's going to record the test cases that caused, um, you know, infinite loops. And this is all AFL is going to do. It's just going to do this over and over again. So then next thing, so, you know, we've done it the first time. Number two, as it comes back to the start, it's going to load the second but if it's going to load the second test case, it's going to change the test case, send it to duck, returns the value, either as a crash, infinite loop, or it's exited cleanly, and it's going to record the value. Step number three, and it's just going to keep doing this over and over again until we tell it to stop. And the really nice thing about this is because, as I've described previously, you know, we're able to go through the file, and because we're able to go through the binary like this, we're able to figure out what data is important what data is significant and because we can do this it gives us the ability to automatically fuzz stuff without knowing the data format you know afl can get really deep or i would say 
very deep into programs, much further than we were either able to do by just random fuzz testing, or which is you know the mutation engine, the dumb way. And it's going to get much further than we can if we just give it a description file. Now you can use description files um, or you know corpuses or valid data um, within this input directory here or this corpus. And this is what I was saying to uh, Mark before. You know you can use machine learning algorithms at this point, and it, you know it it tries to improve this area of your code, right? It tries to give your initial, it tries to give you better initial test data. Um, and then I described something else called symbolic execution. You know, it's going to try and work between these areas here. It's going to try and figure out if this program has any particular arithmetic values or anything it can solve. And if it can solve it, it's going to give you another test case that can get past that check. But this is all AFL does. This is the really important concept. And I'll show you that working. So I previously demonstrated, you know, how do you compile it? And, I, you know, we, we changed that, you know, up here. Or if it's gone, you know, this is us that's actually doing the compilation with the AFL compiler. However, this time, what we're going to do, and remember, this duck, this duck program, it's been updated now because I've attacked it. But as of, I think it was 18 months ago, I was attacking it and I was dropping zero days all over the place. So this is where I started. So th what we're going to do now is we're going to say we're going to get the AFL fuzzer. So whereas before we used the AFL compiler, now we're going to get the AFL fuzzer. Step number one. Tell it what the input directory is. And remember, the input directory is the corpus. It's the set of test cases we start from. Go and give it the output directory to log the files, right? And then finally, we're going to say what the name of the program is that we want to run. And it's going to, or we can actually pass it with the file, but I'm not going to do that. We can just leave this now and we can let this run. Um, it's going to it's going to moan about a few errors and I'll just demonstrate them. So... I've, I've started it run like this, right? And it's going to moan about, I need to type this command in. So AFL has specific commands or specific settings you need to change on your system, mainly to do with performance and your processors. It's not a security issue. Um, I wouldn't recommend fuzzing on your main laptop. Oh, sorry. I wouldn't recommend fuzzing on your main operating system anyway, because it can do, it can just cause a lot of havoc and it can use up a lot of data. But, you know, I'm in a virtual machine, so just type in whatever it gives you. It's just going to be much easier. So it said I've got to type in this command. So I'm going to do it as an admin. Oh, by the way, the password for this virtual machine is fuzz. Because um, otherwise I'd forget it. So I'm just going to paste in that command. Going to leave. I believe I should get one more error. You guys won't get this. Oh, at risk data. I need to get rid of the data and out. Let's run that. Yeah, cool. Uh, AFL, cool. Ignore what I did, but I'm just rerunning the program. Although, I don't seem to want to run. Okay, there we go. Oh, need to zoom out. Oh, bollocks. Okay, so this is AFL. This is what it's doing. Does anyone watch Mr. Robot? Mr. Robot actually used this tool to find a zero day. In season three. I can find... I, I, I tried to find the clip the other day for someone, but I couldn't find it. Let me try and find the screenshot. Let me try and find it. Here we go. So this is the scene from Mr. Robot. If everyone can see that. So this is AFL running. Um, he 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 found six crashes. He found nine hundred nine paths. He ran it for two hours four minutes. It ran at a ridiculous execution speed. I don't think it would ever run that fast. Um, but it ran four point two two, and that is the screen. Right. This is what we're running. So I've run this. Uh, so let's just go through this interface. American fuzzy lock. Remember that's a rabbit, or because it's a fuzzy rabbit. This is what it got, where it's got its name from. And the binary we're attacking is duck. Um, it's been running for one minute and nine seconds. The latest new path. Remember when I was saying about paths, this is telling us when the last new path or you know branch or direction through the program was found. Because it's finding them about once every second, it's just constantly updating. Um, 
last unique crash if if the program crashes and it doesn't always happen remember it's quite rare that this happens this quickly is this will say when the last time the program crashed we found three crashes if for every crash you should really realize this every crash you find in afl is a potential zero day so in this code here when i did it there was three four now four potential zero days right this is this this is what you do hmm? yeah so no, this is that, that this is the one that's got like twelve thousand, eleven thousand in. So now, so, so now when you say like twelve k, um, remember it's that's just the the locations. You have to combine them, so it would be like twelve thousand to the power of twelve thousand or whatever it is a ridic a ridiculously large number. Yeah, yeah, you're not going to get through all of those paths, but what you want to do is you want to get through the significant ones. No, 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 look, up here. Uh, where did I do it? Yeah, I am. So here, when I originally built the program and I added the instrumentation, right? It was 24,000, not 12,000, 24,000, right? So it added 24,000, maybe 24,200 different areas that got instrumented, right? Are you okay, Evan? That's where we got that from. No, that's just the blocks. Yeah, Be because like, let me try and demonstrate this. So this is quite difficult. It's an exponential increase. So you can for sure say how many places you've instrumented. So I can come down here and say I've instrumented one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 places, right? But that doesn't mean, no, those are blocks. Those are instrumented blocks. A path would be a particular one you go down, right? Now, if there's 11 blocks in this code, right, now there's at least 11 paths through it. Because, you know, however, you can have multiple ones. So, like, let, let's just try and find 11 paths. You can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 12 and you can have many more paths than you can have blocks of code right it's almost a lot of the time it's almost impossible to calculate how many paths exist in the code it's such a large unfathomable number so this is what it means by path so an instrumented block is each one of these individual things a path is the direction as you go down the program do you understand yep yeah paths are as you go through it's it's as you walk right it's like when you're walking down the street or you're going down you know going through a city each junction you go to there's a different direction you can go however you because you can choose like different directions through the city right you can go to the first junction and turn right go to the second one turn left it's up to you but those junctions are these individual bits of you know blocks here and the path you go through is the total path you go the total journey you take Yeah, well, the whole thing, not just the street, the whole thing, your journey, the whole journey. Yeah, and now you can choose to go in many directions. You can go back on yourself, you can go forward, left, right. So like for each, each one of these you get to, like here, there is four directions you can go. You can go back, left, right, down. So there's four. So for every one of these, you can say there's at least three or four different ways. And there's not always just four. You know, you can have multiple ones added. Sometimes you can go backwards. Sometimes you can go forwards. Sometimes you can loop round for a bit. And they are different. They're different paths you can go in. So there's a lot more paths almost all of the time. In non-trivial examples, there's going to be more paths than there is instrumented blocks of code. Depends how many blocks it goes through. The path can include as many. It can include thousands, ten thousands. Yep. It depends. Yeah, you can have different length paths, right? So that's also a possibility. So let me try and find an example. So, you know, the end, the, let's say the pro, let's say there's only two ways to end this program here. The only two ways is you can either go to this direction or you can go to this direction, right? 
So I'm going to pick a path. So I go one, two, three, three blocks. However, I could also go one, two, three, three blocks in that direction. But I could also go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's a different path. They're, they could all be different distances. So it depends on it depends when you run it, how many of these blocks you went through when you exited, before you exited. So that's a path. Yes. Yeah. I can show you. Yeah, I can show you. So, um, what AFL is doing is remember I said it has that log. It has that log directory. Uh, if I just go to the log directory duct tape, remember this is this is those initial test cases, the start starting set of data. Um, they haven't changed. But I can go to the output directory and I can go to the queue. And we can actually, these are all the different things that we've had. So um, at the moment in that directory, oh, I've just crashed it because I've gone in there. Because I've gone in that directory, there is 855 different uh, files. And I can open up one of these files. Um, actually, I'll just open them all. So it's just creating different bits of JavaScript, right? Or it's or I want to say different bits of JavaScript. Some of this may or may not be valid JavaScript, but it's just trying different things. So here it's done something completely different, right? And it can actually, if you leave it for long enough, it can actually start generating its own valid code. This is a really head mind the bite mind warpy concept. I'll show you this in a, in a sort of upcoming week week, but you can actually generate like images out of thin air and stuff you can generate xml files out of thin air you can generate valid code out of thin air if you wanted to with a fuzzle it's a bit like you know when you say you can have a million monkeys writing a million typewriters and eventually you'll get shakespeare right it's the same principle yeah apart from the difference between afl is or sorry instrumented code is instead of just doing it randomly we have some sort of performance metric we have some sort of measure that's able to turn around and go, we want to go in this direction, we want to go in that direction. Like, we we have some feedback, which is nice. So let me rerun this, just because that happened. I accidentally exited. So again, um, like I said, just go for the interface. We have the runtime, how long it's been running for, how many cycles, I wouldn't worry about that yet, that's how many different depths it's gone to. Hopefully it should never be more than zero or one because that's basically you've fuzzed the whole thing and you've not got any further. Last new path when we've discovered the last new path, last new crash. The thing's actually crashed, right? Um, last unique hang. Hangs are infinite loops. It's it's taken too long to respond. Um, I'm not going to go into this map coverage thing because it just it's to do with your density code measurements and it's not that important. The stage that you're at is based on the fuzzing strategy, right? So the fuzzing strategy, like I said before, is you could flip one bit of information, you could flip an entire byte of operation. Arithmetics means you you know you include pluses, divisions, you try like divide by zero, you have these different things. So these are the mutation strategies. So this block here is it's this bit here. When it does the mutation, this is what I'm describing, right? This is what that mutation is. So these fuzzing strategies are those mutations, each one. You can add your own as well. So like I said, first one, bit flips. Second one, byte flips. Arithmetics, you're doing plus, minus, divisions. Known integers, so some integers are known to be bad. Dividing by zero is a really good example. You know, minus one is another good example. The largest value you can represent as a 32-bit integer, about four and a half billion is another example. Dictionary, so um, there's none been in here, but you can actually include your own. So if you're fuzzing an XML XML parser, for instance, you can actually add in your own uh, descriptions of XML, for instance. And because you can add in your own descriptions of XML, or your own keywords, should I say, you can add in dictionaries. Havoc is just random. It's just doing random stuff. It's just reading random data in. Um, Pi custom, you can add your own. Um, and trim is basically it's reducing bits of data and flipping them around. 
those are the most important bits um you've also got like total crashes total timeouts which paths are more important than others which ones if you're always hitting the same edge or you're always going the same through the same code it's not really going to be a favored path you want to go to new locations right this stage processor up here you've got how many things you're executing per second how many things you've executed in total and the stage you're at so at the moment we've gone 69 percent 70 percent the way through this havoc stage what airfall is going to do is it's going to go it's just going to do it's just going to go down here it's going to start at the top with bit flips go to bike flips arithmetics no and just go around when this gets to 100 you should see it start to go through those it should start to flip so you just flip through them really really quickly when it goes through havoc this time it's going to do it again so when it gets to 100 it's going to go again and it's going to keep doing this over and over again and it uses these strategies yep yeah no because it doesn't know how long it's going to take it takes forever right theoretically you don't know how long it's going to take this bit flip here what do you mean? No, 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 no. So this is so what this means is is bit flips. It means it's generated three hundred and twenty bit flips. It's just added some more three hundred fifty two bit flips, and only forty four of those bit flips found a new path. That's what it means. So it did forty eight bite flips in this case, and none of them found a new path. However, as you can see, the ha yeah, uh, so yeah, so there's different stages. So you'll also see it's gonna, you'll also see it's going to go through stage one, stage two, and stage three. So this will be stage one, stage two, and stage three. It'll do some bit flips in one order. It'll do some bit flips in a different order, and another set of bit flips. So this is what it means by these strategy yields. So forty-four of this first. This is where it gets complicated. The first instance of the bit flip strategy has flipped 384 times but it's only found 44 new paths the second instance or the second strategy of the bit flip strategy has is flipped 438 times but only found 22 and as you can see havoc tends to be the most important and it's done 167,000 in total but it's found 572 new paths so if you add all of these together you should actually get to the total paths number right so fuzzing is a bit different because like there's there's no different way to like th there's no concept of you you generate random data in a different way it's just random data it isn't so it doesn't have any more values after it because it doesn't need them it just doesn't really make sense yeah yeah well the effectiveness yeah especially if you add your own right like and then you want to measure the performance of your own that's what it's for really It depends what you want to add in there. You can make your own. Ah. To be fair, I don't really know what the pie means. I've just always taken that as custom. It's just custom stuff you can add. And obviously we haven't put any custom ones in, so it hasn't found anything new. Um, but this is what... You don't know. You don't know when a computer... So like Alan, Alan Turing, like I said before, like it's impossible to know... And you should, this is really interesting, it's one of my favourite areas of computer science, is that there are some types of problems, and, well, let me first say this. I talked before about processors essentially are the same thing. The difference is, is between how quickly they can perform certain tasks and how much energy they can perform. That is really the big difference between them. There's really no other difference. They can all do the same tasks as everyone else. And this is a limitation of machines and computers. And Alan Turing proved this right really really interesting sort of area of computer science to get into so there are certain problems that just we know are impossible to solve right there are certain problems very trivial examples that we know we can always solve like we can always take a program and we can say this program is always going to finish it's always going to exit anything that gets sufficiently complicated anything that's non-trivial shall i say it's in, it's impossible to tell really in a general way not for a particular program in as specifically, but as a general way, it's impossible to tell. I won't say impossible. It's very difficult to tell whether or not a program is eventually going to end or it's going to go on forever. So we could fuzz this for 10,000 years 
and it'll take 10,000 years to find a bug. We could run through this for 10,000 years and it's found every single bug, right? It, it, it's really dependent. However, th there is a heuristic called Cycles Done. I won't explain this this week. I'll explain it in the upcoming weeks, but that's generally your indicator for when you should stop fuzzing. That doesn't mean you found all of the paths. It doesn't mean you found all of the bugs. This is just a best effort, and you can never do better than a best effort. So in certain circumstances, if you create a model of the program and its behavior perfectly, or at least good enough, you can perform... Um, bounded model checks and things like symbolic execution checks and that will solve every single possible um, way through the Capriga and you can guarantee that you have mathematically checked every single location and you sometimes hear it in the news when people go this program has mathematically been proven it's safe like it's 100% safe what they actually mean is they've built a model and then they've run some tests against that model some map like satisfiability modulo theories they've run bounded model checking against that specific model to check whether or not it has actually ex is actually finished however for non-trivial examples it's almost it's impossible to tell whether or not that finishes but as a general sense i just say it's impossible to tell or near impossible to tell if a computer if a program's finished or it's going to stop so we can never be sure evan it's just it's like a, it's a intractable problem Well, they're crashes. They're, they're, well, you can't say guaranteed zero days. Um, they're crashes, right? Um, that's, yeah, potential. Well, I mean, they are errors, right? Because it crashed. It is an error. But whether or not it's an exploitable error, I don't know. That's the next step. So I'm only teaching about fuzzing. So I'm teaching about that this is a strategy for how you discover bugs, right? Because the next thing you've got to do is like, when we, it, like, fine, I'll demonstrate some of the bugs. We go, actually, it's a bug. It, does it crash? Does it cause a stack overflow? Does it cause a heap overflow? Does it cause some sort of other error? We're not sure of a null point of dereference is a very common one. And then number one, if it causes a null point of dereference, can we exploit it? You know, not every crash you can exploit in every way. Like it's it's dependent, and that's that's part of the art and where your experience comes from and actually you know attacking stuff. The one thing that I get really annoyed with, um, a well, I've done all of the Sanders courses, right? I've done the 660, the 760, the 560, all the red team ones. I've done the OSCP. I've done the OSCE. You know, I've done loads of different types of courses and even like hack the box stuff. And what really annoys me about all of those situations is none of them teach you how to find bugs. They give you a file. They give you a thing and they say, this code is buggy. There is a bug in it, right? Here is a example way that you can go and exploit. Here's your initial test case. That's really easy to do because if I know that but if I know that binary is exploitable and I have at least a bit of an idea where it is in the binary, I can just sit there all evening and go and crack it and write an exploit because I know it's vulnerable. I don't know, almost in every circumstance, I don't know if a system's exploitable. I don't know if a system's vulnerable. And this is the much, much more difficult thing that no one teaches. And one of the tools that you use for detecting this it's things like AFL, it's things like Hong Fuzz, it's fuzzing. And I I, I, said I like fuzzing, that's just the thing I picked, and I got really good at, but it's just the thing that I know a lot about, and hence why I'm teaching it. So that's the sort of strategy you take, and I'll, and I'll demonstrate that now. So, you know, we found some bugs, right? So what we can actually do, if I go back, so in crashes, if you go into crashes, you can see these are all the files that called, caused crashes, right? These are significant. Uh, obviously, shouldn't have read the last one. That was a readme. So it turns out this this thing here, for some reason, crashes the program. I don't know what it means, but it crashes the program. And we can actually check that. So if I just cat ID zero zero, this crashes for some reason. That one character that we I don't know what it does. We can dump that in next dump. Bash to V. No C is not what we're doing. So if we send these bytes to it for some reason, it will cause a crash. Potential zero day, right? Think of the scenario where you might exploit it. Let's say this is running on a user's web browser and the web browser browses to my server. You know, I put an advert. So, you know, when you get adverts at the side of stuff on like Facebook, I guess Facebook's got adverts. I've been on in ages or like YouTube or something. There's an advert. If I, in that advert, include this, you know, bit of text, right? 
and your web browser uses this duct tape engine to interpret the JavaScript, and I put in this value as the JavaScript, your browser's going to crash, right? That's where the power comes from. If I can find a way to influence the code of your browser because I found a bug in it, I can essentially start taking over your computer. I can start literally hacking your computer. And a really, in a way, a few years ago, like back in 2008, that people did this, is you would get hackers, they would go and buy loads of different ads, and they would include malware within the ads. So if you went to a website, it would have like a JavaScript bit of JavaScript in it and an iframe. And when that iframe loaded, it would export your browser. And this is one of the ways they use to discover those initial bugs to, you know, create the exploits for. So, you know, let, like I said, let's test this. Let's see, right? No, people got wise to it, right? And went, you know, you're not allowed to include JavaScript and stuff. You can, so there are different things you can do. So, um, there was a browser exploitation framework, Beef, that you can, stuff you can do. So if you can, like, what happens now is you can hack the website itself if it's a particularly easy website to hack and then you can just install malicious firmware like malicious stuff in the web browser itself as opposed to the adverts because the advert you know the people google ads and stuff got wise to it um or you know you can try and do a man in the middle attack if you're on wi-fi or you know someone's on your network and you know you connect to a non-encrypted non-protected http website or you redirect them let's say you sit in a you know you sit in a cafe uh, sorry, uh, like a coffee shop or something that's got Wi-Fi, Starbucks, yeah, whatever. You connect to it. You do a man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, you can do, um, you know, do this on NDP for IP version 6. IP version 4, you use, what's it called? ARP, you do ARP cache poisoning. You intercept those packets, and as those packets go through your computer, you can change the web pages as they're sent back to another user, right? And if you can change the web pages as they're sent back towards the other user, you're able to inject things like this. And if you can inject things like this, and this you know, JavaScript engine is used within that web browser, you can actually exploit and remotely hack someone's computer. So this is where, this is the, but this is only discovering that initial bug in that web browser, for instance, or you know, the engine that runs the JavaScript in that web browser. That's just the use case. So I'm going to read that, you know, that first file, 000, right? I'm going to read that, and I'm going to pass it to that duck. And it causes a segmentation fault, right? Segmentation fault, classic crash, classic bug. I can actually go through and read all of them. Uh, let me just find it, find out crashes. Uh, read all of them. Uh, da, 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 the exec. Oh, God, I've got to remember by, got to remember by. I've got to, what's the fucking thing gone? Oh, you bastard. Oh, what's the find command for doing exec? I can't remember. Does anyone remember off the top of my head? That's it, yeah, you're right, you've got it. There we go. You're correct. Cheers. <laughs> See, I don't remember everything all the time. Um, we'll just write a quick loop uh, for I in. I'm just gonna, f you know, read these. Uh, oh God, exec braces. Which all I'm doing now is I'm just reading the files in a loop, and I'm just gonna pass them to the. Uh, uh, just gonna pass them to the value for I. Just echo them. Now that seems to work. Now I want the files only. We're just going to quickly check what types of bugs we get. Whatever. Permission denied. What's the same permission denied? Interesting. Was it? Did I run a pseudo? But I've just read it as, as a user. What? I'm well confused. Why is that moaning? I'm going to go and debug this quickly just to see what I'm doing wrong. Are you okay? Oh no, wait, I don't need to do that, do I? Can I do that? I think I've just used my format wrong. There we go. Yeah, I just I just did it wrong. I, I shouldn't have run it within. I shouldn't have caused it run the exact in the find. 
Uh, cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that file, read the file for each one, and then I'm going to pipe it into Duck. And excellent. So these are the different types of things we've got. We got a segmentation fault, segmentation fault, a range error, and then it cleans up. We've got a segmentation fault again, ranged error, segmentation fault, segmentation fault. And all of these, AFL thinks they're different. Now they may or may not be different. Um, what's really interesting here is we can guarantee we've actually got two different bugs. So in this first instance, we ran duct tape, right? And then it just crashed. In this final one, we ran duct tape, said buffer's too long. So it knows that the buffer's too long. It knows that there's some sort of bug, right? And then it causes an internal error. It cleans up and then it crashes. So it crashes after it's returned and detected the bug, but it still crashes. So the thing actually seems to be detecting if a buffer's too long, but then it crashes anyway. So I don't really see what the point of that check is. So we've actually just said, look, these are some bugs that we found. We've verified that they are bugs. And, you know, like I said, we can still just keep there running AFL and doing this. Anyway, um, anyone have any questions about that? Everyone understand. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, the exploit is the thing that, you know, takes it. Potential vulnerabilities. I'll put it that way. It's probably the best, best terminology to use. Well, exploitable code. So the exploit is the thing that exploits the vulnerability. So the vulnerability will be is the potential error so you have errors which might just be um, trivial and meaningless um, or you have to, to be fair in the context of this if this javascript engine crashes for any reason i'd be pretty happy to say that all vulnerabilities that's because i know for sure that if i get this javascript to you know one of the engines running this like an old iot device or someone's web browser it will crash so that is a denial of service bug, right? That's not going to always be the case. Um, but this is just an example. It depends on your context. It depends on the exact use case, the different languages, what the device you're attacking is. So because we're looking at this in terms of um, when, when you say architecture as well, I want to make I want to make the point is that you're saying 32 bit, 64 bit. Remember, you also have PowerPC, you have MIPS, you have ARM, you have Spark and you have the 32 bit variations. You have RISC-V, you have 64 bit variations. So this is actually testing the code itself. It's testing those branch statements. I would say almost all of the time, unless it's some really weird scenario and this can, it can happen that if you've got a bug on an intel thing like this then you've probably also then it's def, it's probably almost guaranteed to be a bug on arm the exploit will be different how it will work will be different whether or not it is vulnerable on an intel chip or whether or not it's vulnerable on an arm chip is different but there is some sort of at least error there even on 32 bit to 64 bit it can change it depends. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that is an equally applicable thing. So we're testing a, you know, a one type of build but we're very, we, like because we've built it from the source code because we've built it from the source code it's more likely I would say that the bug is going to exist in other architectures however there are situations where it will be exploitable on 32 bit whereas it won't be exploitable on 64 bit and vice versa there will be situations where it will crash on you know an ARM processor and not a PowerPC processor However, I think that's going to be the minority of the time, not most of the time. 
I think most of the time, if you get a crash in one, it's pro it's probably an error on the rest. Yeah, that's completely different. Like so that that's not just about architecture, it could be about architecture, it could be about whether or not that particular version of software, you know, has ASLR enabled for every module, whether or not it's got control flow guard. It you know, maybe the you know, maybe the rock chain um, gadgets that it's using are different in different locations based on that version. You know, when it comes down to actually writing the exploit, it's gonna be entirely dependent on the specific version. But frankly, me me as a vulnerability researcher i find vulnerabilities i can write exploits and you know they're good fun to write and i do write them for when i need to do demonstrations but for me i can turn around and so i can i can turn around to my client and say i could spend six months trying to exploit this bug for you on say two or three of your platforms or you could just fix it it is a bug you could just fix it or you could pay me for another six months to exploit it and, you know, if they turn around and if it's trivial to do and I can do it in maybe like a weekend or I can do it over a week, I might do it. I might go and exploit it. But vulnerability research and frankly, most of the time isn't about exploitation. It's about finding problems. It's about fixing problems and fixing errors. Yes, Metasploit's all well and good. And that's, you know, the realm that penetration testers work in. And that's where they want to sit. But, you know, it's not a, it's not a huge amount of use for my time to exploit every bug that I find. And most of the time, the bugs aren't going to be exploitable anyway. But because the bug's not exploitable, it doesn't mean there's not a bug, right? And, you know, I've I've got, a, I believe this summer, I've got like a really, really big bug coming out that should cause some waves around the world. But, um, you know, I do exploit stuff. I can exploit stuff. It's just, it doesn't always pay me to do it. It was probably, it was either found by reverse engineering or it was found by some sort of fuzz testing, most likely, I would, I would guess. <laughs> Loads. So, um, so reverse engineering in this sense is I'm reading the code and trying to figure out what the code's doing. So this is reverse engineering. I'm picking it apart. You know, I'm going through here and going like, oh, this load effective address, it's loading, you know, the stack pointer minus this, it's loading this variable, whatever's the, the address, whatever's in this variable into the stack pointer, you know, then it's loading four bytes from, you know, sorry, uh, eight bytes from this value, you know, into, you know, into this value, it's moving, the, and, and, you know, I'm going through and I'm trying to figure out exactly what this program is doing. Doesn't mean I'm actually trying to look for bugs. It means I'm trying to understand what the underlying code looks like. However, in this circumstance, I'm throwing data at the program while it's running to check if it's breaking. So in the first instance, it was what I would call static analysis. You know, the binary here, it's not actually running. We're not actually running it on the processor. We're just inspecting it, right? Here, we're actually physically running the processor in memory on the computer and it's executing. Understand? Cool. Anyway... That's yeah. Yeah. So Gemma so generally, um, keeping them shorter is better. You basically want to get as much code that can generate new paths as possible in smaller files, right? Because if these files are like gigabytes and gigabytes long, it's going to take a very long to test them and execute them. Um, if you've got an XML file parser you want to attack, it's going to be like an XML file. If it's going to be you know, a, a TCP request you're going to attack, 
it's going to be you know a raw data packet of TCP. It depends on your application, but the, generally the smaller the better. But you want to put good solid data in there to begin from because it gives you a head start. Cool. Well, I'm finished, so you guys are all free to go. Um, I normally hang around for a bit in case anyone sort of wants to chat about other stuff, but um, hopefully you guys understood and learned things. Next week we'll be talking about um, Hongfuzz and Libfuzzer, so looking at it from more of a perspective of if I'm a developer and I want to integrate this into testing, I'm going to be looking at it from that perspective.